Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to my wrap up slash discussion video of December's chapters of Our Mutual Friend. If you do not know, I'm currently hosting a very long Victorian style read along of Charles Dickens's Our Mutual Friend, where every month we read three or four chapters just as the Victorians would have done at the time. So today I'm going to be talking about December's chapters. I'm only two weeks late, which is quite good for me. So yes, let's begin. So the chapters we read in the month of December were Book 2, Chapter 7, in which a friendly move is originated, Chapter 8, in which an innocent elopement occurs, Chapter 9, in which the orphan makes his will, and Chapter 10, a successor. So to begin with Book 2, Chapter 7, in which a friendly move is originated. In this chapter we follow Mr Wegg and Mr Venus. Once more, as often with the Wegg-Venus chapters, this chapter is in the present tense for some reason that I have not been able to yet decide, even though I've been trying to work this out since I was about 15. But in this chapter Mr Wegg invites Mr Venus over to Boffin's Bower, which Wegg is currently looking after now that the Boffins have gone off to their fancy other new home. Mr Venus comes to the Bower and with him he brings the bone that used to be from Mr Wegg's leg before he had his leg amputated. They then have quite a long discussion and Mr Wegg suggests a proposal to Mr Venus that they together look through the great mounds of Boffin's Bower, the great mounds of the Harmon estate that Mr Wegg is now looking after, that they search through them to see what money, papers, jewels, etc. they can find. And Mr Venus is presented throughout the book as a less mercenary figure than Mr Wegg, but being very low, due to affairs of the heart as he is, he agrees to Mr Wegg's plan and they decide that this is what they are going to do. They are going to see what they can find amongst the mounds in order to make themselves some money, in order to make a profit. At the end of the chapter Mr Rokesmith drops by and Mr Rokesmith is someone that Mr Wegg feels rather jealous of. Mr Rokesmith in Mr Wegg's eyes is getting rather a lot of advantages from the boffins, he now has a higher social position and Mr Wegg is rather annoyed that he has not profited from the situation as much as he hoped he might and as much as he thinks he could. That is basically what happens in this chapter. More of the very important theme throughout Our Mutual Friend of the connection between money and rubbish because once again people are plotting to make money from rubbish. They have this idea, or Mr Wegg has this idea, that amongst the mounds of rubbish there will be something that will be worth something, whether it's jewels or money or whether it is old papers that he can sell on or effectively blackmail people with. And Mr Wegg and Mr Venus's relationship is quite interesting to look at in this chapter because they have quite an odd relationship in that both of them seem to slightly feel that they are above the other one. Mr Wegg certainly feels that he is above Mr Venus in many ways. For example, Mr Wegg is rather put out by the fact that Mr Venus approaches the house just walking with Mr Wegg's bones wrapped up in a parcel and he's rather surprised that he didn't take a cab and when Mr Venus says that he's not above a parcel, Mr Wegg feels very much that a certain sort of parcel might be above you. So Mr Wegg simultaneously looks down on Mr Venus but also knows that Mr Venus would be quite a useful person, partly because of his trade he would be able to know the value of a lot of the sort of things you might find in a rubbish heap, but also because Mr Wegg is not very physically able and needs someone to help him with the searching of the mounds. But we do see, one, that he thinks himself above him, but also that he finds Mr Venus quite irritating. It's very funny, though also very sad, that Mr Venus keeps on repeating what his love said to him, that she did not want to be regarded in that bony light and therefore did not want to marry him because of his profession. He keeps on repeating this and Mr Wegg keeps on cutting him off because he's tired of it, which is quite entertaining and Dickens uses quite well in this chapter. And there is in that way a sort of enmity between Mr Venus and Mr Wegg. There are quite a lot of sort of skirmishes between them where there's quite clearly some annoyance below, below the surface. We have Mr Wegg implying that actually he didn't need to pay Mr Venus to get his leg back, that he could have had it because it was his right, that legally it still belongs to him and Mr Venus is a bit put out by this and says, I tell you candidly, I don't like your little cases. So despite the fact that there is this kind of friendly suggestion between them that Mr Wegg repeatedly addresses Mr Venus as his brother and as his fellow man and so on and suggests this proposal between them, this proposition, there is also this kind of unfriendly tone beneath there. The title of the chapter is quite interesting here, it's a friendly move but it's also sort of not because these men, although they talk to each other as though they were friends, there is quite clearly an unfriendliness between them as well. Another thing that's interesting to look at in this chapter is Mr Wegg's language. He sets himself up as an artist, he quotes poetry, he says a lot of kind of romantic things as it were about fellow men and camaraderie and in doing things for the course of right I think is the phrase he uses, but actually we all know it's very very clear that what he wants is money and in many ways Mr Wegg is just as much a fake as the Lamleys who are pretending to be kind 
caring people who actually or all, all of their intentions are all about money and Mr Wegg is just the same and he acts as I think as quite an interesting parallel to the Lamneys because obviously the Lamneys are a very different class to Mr Wegg but actually in many ways they share a lot of the same characteristics and a lot of the same drives. There is one other thing that motivates Mr Wegg which is quite interesting here and that is his dislike of Mr Rokesmith and his dislike of Mr Boffin and his dislike of Mr Boffin is one thing he feels that Mr Boffin has passed over him he feels that he had this prospect to get on in like to get a lot more kind of respectability and status and money than he thought he would ever have in his life. This opportunity was presented to him and then as far as he is concerned has been taken away, has been taken by the secretary, by Mr Rokesmith. Mr Boffin is no longer sort of patronising Wegg as it were, he is now taking care of and promoting Mr Rokesmith over him. So Wegg in that way feels very unfriendly towards Mr Boffin but also towards the secretary and we see here that although he is motivated by his wanting of money he's also motivated by his desire to discredit Mr Rokesmith and his desire to discredit Mr Boffin. He's very suspicious of Mr Rokesmith and of Mr Rokesmith's intentions and his involvement with the Boffins but he also kind of wants to bring Mr Boffin down because he feels that he has been treated unfairly that he deserves more than his lot in life. It's kind of clear that Mr Wegg's intention would be not just to get money but in some way to destroy the boffins and to destroy Mr Rokesmith in that process. He's motivated not just by a desire for money but also by a desire for a kind of revenge. But now let's talk about chapter 8 of book 2 in which an innocent elopement occurs. The minion of fortune and the worm of the hour, or in less cutting language, Nicodemus Boffin, Esquire, the Golden Dustman, had become as much at home in his eminently aristocratic family mansion as he was ever likely to be. He could not but feel that, like an eminently aristocratic family cheese, it was much too large for his wants and bred an infinite amount of parasites, but he was content to regard this drawback on his property as a sort of perpetual legacy duty. I have to say, I do always enjoy Dickens's language very much. It is very, very entertaining. So in this chapter, we get to see a lot more of Bella Wilfer's character, and Dickens works quite well here to give Bella a more sympathetic light than she is often seen in. This chapter begins with showing us how the Boffins are getting on in their new household in which Bella is living with them. We see Bella's interest and curiosity about the secretary. She doesn't really like him, she feels slightly unnerved by him, but she also doesn't quite understand him. And nor do Mr and Mrs Boffin. We learn that the secretary refuses to go into society. Mr Boffin thinks that he has something against Mr Lightwood. We all know that he's worried that Mr Lightwood will recognise him as Julius Hanford, the mysterious man they met on the night of John Harmon's murder. And then Mr Rokesmith has a conversation with Bella in which he asks her if she ever has any messages to send back to the family in Holloway where he is still lodging and she feels rather hurt by the implication whether or not he meant it or she inferred it that she doesn't see enough of her family so she decides that she will pay a visit home. She goes back to see her mother and sister and it all goes disastrously wrong and everyone ends up in tears because they are all slightly insane and it's a very odd scene. But after that she goes and finds her pa, her lovely father who she cares about so much. She makes him take the afternoon off work, she buys him a suit and they go to Greenwich and have a very fine dinner and a very long conversation in which Bella reveals to him that she feels she is a terrible person, that she is very mercenary and that she wants money and she's going to marry it. There's so many things that interest me in this chapter. It's definitely my favourite of the four chapters we've read in the month of December and I really really enjoy this one. It's nice to get a closer look at Bella's personality and I think Dickens works very carefully here to show her failings and show her aims but also show that she is a, a better person than she at times acts, that she does feel guilty for the way she is in some ways. It's interesting that at the back of my Penguin edition has like a chapter plan for each chapter, Dickens' original notes. The chapter plan for this chapter in which an innocent elopement occurs, these are Dickens' original notes. Pave the way to Rumpty's being Bella's friend and confident. They have a day out together. She spends her money in buying him clothes and treating him. Say she is mercenary and why. But, and this is underlined, indicate better qualities, interest the reader in her. I think it's quite interesting just to see Dickens' aims here because it's so, like, obviously it's much more subtle in the actual book and when you read his notes it's just so unsubtle. I want to make people like Bella more here, which is really entertaining because I do think you do get that impression from this chapter. You get to see a lot more of her relationship with her father, but also you get to see more of her relationship with the Boffins and also her relationship with the secretary. Now Bella's relationship with Mr Rokesmith and the way she perceives him and feels about him is quite interesting to look at because she has quite conflicting feelings towards him. Mr Boffin says that he can't quite make him out, neither could Bella, so she found the subject rather interesting. 
she doesn't like him and she is offended by the knowledge that he admires her and that he is not completely in love with her but a little bit so she is offended by that but she also finds it slightly flattering and she also finds it slightly interesting because she can't work out what kind of man Mr Rokesmith is she doesn't know how to judge him and she wants to know how to judge people so we have this odd situation where she doesn't like him and she doesn't like the fact that he likes her but she is nonetheless sort of drawn to him. She does find herself ruffled by the things he says. When he suggests that he could take messages to her family, she finds herself immediately concerned about the fact that she hasn't sent messages to her family. Is he judging her for that? And she wants to know. In the conversation they have in the start of this chapter, as often in their conversations, she takes one thing he says in a slightly different way, has a sort of rude and sharp reply and then apologises for it because she realises she's been too hasty with him and she often is and the way she sort of loses her temper with him is quite interesting to observe because it shows that he does have some effect on her. Two incidences of the little interview were felt by Miss Bella herself when alone again to be very curious. The first was that he unquestionably left her with a penitent air upon her and a penitent feeling in her heart. The second was that she had not had an intention or a thought of going home until she had announced it to him as a settled design. She becomes defensive in their conversation, says she is going to go home and then decides that she must. And this here is quite interesting because it shows that he has some sort of odd power over her. And then we move on to the rather preposterous scene of when Bella goes home to see her mother and her sister. This scene annoys me because it's one of those incidences in Dickens which you don't get as much in the later Dickens but you do get in the early Dickens of random hysterical women crying for no apparent reason. It's really funny but it's also like Dickens. Dickens you can do better, you can do more interesting things than that. Regardless, when the fact that when Bella goes home to see her mother and sister the first thing that happens is that they have a huge argument about ridiculous silly things that whether or not people might grow after they were married and then all end up crying is quite significant because it shows the lack of a good home life that Bella ever had. It shows partly the fact that the three of them could never have got on very well but also it shows that the kind of resentment that her family feel now that she's risen above them in this way. The fact that Lavinia, her sister, is so jealous of her and the fact that her mother is sort of jealous of her too but in a very stiff polite cold way in which she implies that she disapproves of everything. Again in the way that Bella behaves with her mother and sister we do see how spoiled she is. Dickens says earlier in this chapter that she is doubly spoiled. Spoiled first by poverty and then by wealth. There's an Oscar Wilde quote in which he said, I think possibly in the picture of Dorian Gray but I'm not sure, that the only people who think more about money than the rich are the poor and that is what Dickens is kind of saying here. Bella has been brought up obsessed with money because she was poor and now that she lives in a wealthy household she is again obsessed with money because she has money. The way that she then interacts with her mother and sister, this very sort of silly argument, again shows her sort of childishness in many ways and her immaturity. And yet the day out she has with her father is very different and very telling and is where Dickens is clearly trying to make us like Bella more because we see a different side of her, we see a generous side of her, we see a fond affectionate side of her, we see a side of her that loves her father very dearly more than anyone else really that wants to help him, that gives him anything she can, that buys him a new suit, takes him out for dinner and then the remainder of the money gives to him to buy presents for the rest of her family. But it's not just this that is important here, it's not just the relationship with her father and the way it's developed and the fact that she is is as generous to him as she can, it's the fact that afterwards she goes home and cries because she feels so guilty. And Dickens is doing something very purposeful here where he's trying to show that she is not a good person. I mean look at the long conversation she has with her father about how much she desires money above all else. But to show that although she knows the kind of person she is, she sort of wishes she were better than she is. And that is I think something really interesting about Bella and something I really like about her character. It's not that she is a good person, it's that she's aware that she's not a good person and that makes her unhappy. On the one hand she gives this money to her father and takes him out because she loves him and she cares about him and she wants to help him. And on the other hand she does it a bit to satisfy her own guilt for abandoning her family and to sort of prove to herself and in a way to Mr Rokesmith that Mr Rokesmith's implications that she doesn't spend enough time with her family are unfounded but she knows in fact that they are founded and that she has sort of abandoned her family and that's why she goes back to the Boffin's household at the end and cries. I also think that the relationship she has with her father is really interesting because I've spoken a bit before about the fact that there aren't very many like happy parental relationships in Dickens, there aren't that many sort of parent-child relationships that are happy and most of the happy parent-child relationships in Dickens are between children and surrogate parents rather than actual biological parents and it's quite interesting that 
although Bella has a very good relationship with her father, Dickens does a lot to present her father as a boy, as a child. There is a lot of talk about him being like a cherub. Bella says, you are not like a pa, but more like a sort of younger brother with a dear venerable chubbiness on him. This idea that they are very, very close, they have a good friendship, but actually their relationship is not really like a father and daughter, it's more like a brother and sister, or more like Bella is the parent of him, the way she attempts to patronise him. I think that's done quite interestingly, and it's very interesting when we look at sort of parent figures in Dickens as a whole. Then we have to look at the things she says to her father, her desire for money and the way she speaks about it. I am the most mercenary little wretch that ever lived in the world. It's not that I care for money to keep as money, but I do care so much for what I will buy. When I was at home and only knew what it was to be poor, I grumbled but didn't so much mind. When I was at home expecting to be rich, I thought vaguely of all the great things I would do, but when I had been disappointed of my splendid fortune and came to see it day by today in other hands and to have before my eyes what I could really do, then I became the mercenary little wretch that I am. I have made up my mind that I must have money, Pa. I feel that I can't beg it, borrow it or steal it, and so I have resolved that I must marry it. I hate and detest being poor, and I won't be poor if I can marry money. And we see for Bella it's not just a matter of wanting money, it's also a matter of being calculating about her future, the kind of life she wants to lead, and the way she has to act in her mind to get that life. So we have a very complicated portrait of Bella in this chapter because Dickens presents her both in this very simple light in that she wants money, in a way she's almost as mercenary as like Mr Wegg, but on the other hand we also see her fondness for her father and her guilt over the kind of person she knows she is. So yes, all in all, a very interesting chapter, and yes, Bella is a very interesting character. Moving on. And now into the sadness of chapter 9, in which the orphan makes his will. In this chapter, Mr Sloppy turns up at the Boffins' household to inform them that the orphan Johnny that Mrs Boffin was going to adopt is ill. We follow the Boffins, Bella and the secretary to go and see the orphan, and the orphan is taken away from Betty Higdon to a hospital where he dies. And this is quite a sad chapter and also quite important. It's interesting because I have, it's been so long since I read this for the first time that I don't really remember sort of what my predictions were going through and obviously when I read it for the first time I read it sort of not you know not in one sitting but over a few weeks. It's been really interesting doing this read along and hearing other people's comments about what they think is to come in the plot and two of the things that have kind of taken me by surprise is one how much people liked Charlie Hexham in the first part when I knowing knowing that later he becomes a little bit less nice that sort of took me by surprise because I'd never really viewed him as a nice character because it wasn't very long before I discovered that he was a bit selfish. And the other thing that surprised me was the character of little Johnny the orphan and how much emphasis a lot of people were placing on him, expecting him to sort of turn into a kind of pip figure from Great Expectations. But actually, he's gone very, very soon. And knowing that, it, I never really thought about him in, in the same way. But it's interesting to see doing this read long, what the Victorian reading public must have thought, because they also must have thought that this little orphan boy would have a massive impact. His death happened so quickly, we find out he's ill and then he's dead within the course of a chapter. It must have been quite shocking for the Victorian public. But there were quite a few things of interest in this chapter, like he has previously when dealing with Mrs Higdon. He drops into this voice that he sometimes does in his social criticism chapters, where he's talking directly to the reader, to my lords and gentlemen and honourable boards. He is making a direct political social statement of, look, this is the kind of thing that happens to poor children all over the country. This boy, Johnny, stops becoming a character and becomes a symbol for child poverty, just as Oliver Twist is in Oliver Twist, for example. Johnny, at this point, stops being a character and becomes a symbol for all of the children like him that die in terrible situations and an illness throughout Victorian Britain. That's what Dickens is saying here by addressing the reader in that direct way. Likewise, the way that Betty Higdon responds the fact that she is so appalled by the idea that they might take him to the poorhouse when of course they're just trying to take him to a hospital. This again, Dickens is setting up as something bigger than just this individual family. But the other thing that Dickens does in this chapter, which is quite significant, is builds the characters of Bella and of Mr. Rokesmith. In the last chapter, we got to see Bella in a more positive light, but it's in this chapter, especially in which the orphan makes his will, that we get to see both Bella and Mr. Rokesmith in an even more positive light because Dickens uses this tragedy to show both of these characters as the good people they are. Underneath Mr. Rokesmith's mystery, underneath Bella's mercenary nature, we see their kindness in the way that they act towards the orphan and also in the way that they act towards Mrs. Boffin. Bella's behaviour was very tender and very natural and she kneeled on the brick floor to clasp the child. The way that she acts towards the orphan 
shows her in a better, more true light than most of the rest of her showy behaviour. We see her in a better light, and also so does Mr Rokesmith who is present, and that's important there. And likewise the way that Mr Rokesmith acts, the fact that Mr Rokesmith is the only one who realises how serious the danger is, and so he goes back to see the orphan late at night when no one else is there. There are two things that are important to note here. One is the way that he feels about the orphan, the fact that he feels drawn to the orphan in some way and feels particularly connected to him. We find out in the next chapter, for example, that Mr. Rokesmith is an orphan too, and the fact that he goes to see the orphan and feels so sorry for him is of significance. In a way, there are two reasons why Mr. Rokesmith goes back to see Johnny. One is for himself, and the other is for Mrs. Boffin, who he has a great fondness for. Nobody but Rokesmith knew for certain how that doctor had said this should have been days ago, too late. But Rokesmith knowing it, and knowing that his bearing it in mind would be acceptable thereafter to that good woman who had been the only light in the childhood of desolate John Harmon dead and gone, resolved late at night that he would go back to the bedside of John Harmon's namesake and see how it fared with him. Mr Rokesmith is the one that is there when Johnny dies, when Johnny, this kind, small baby orphan, gives his toys to the boy in the bed next to him and kisses Mr Rokesmith as a will, part wanting him to pass the kiss on to Bella. It's a bit... Like, oh, I know a lot of people say that Dickens is really sentimental, and I love the sentimentality, but obviously, like, having Johnny the orphan give the toys to the boy in the bed next to him is just, like, not, like, overdoing it. Like, I still find it really moving. I especially find it moving, the fact that Mr. Rokesmith is the one that's there, because he is such an important character in the book. But, but Dickens is being purposefully very sentimental, purposefully trying to draw in the emotions of his readers, partly because he wants them to engage with the book, but also because he's making a social and political statement about illness and poverty within the Victorian period. But anyway, moving on to the next chapter. Chapter 10, A Successor. In A Successor, we focus instead on the character of Sloppy. After the death of Johnny, Mrs Boffin, who was already about as selfless as people go, decides that she was being too selfish and not selfless enough in wanting to adopt an orphan baby who would be pretty and bring her lots of love, and decides that what she wants to do is share a fortune and adopt an orphan who she can really, really make a difference to. And she goes for someone slightly older and someone less pretty, less appealing, but also very interesting, and that is the character of Sloppy. I really like Sloppy as a character. I think he's very interesting and I like the he is important in the book and I think his his role and his change over the course of the book is quite interesting. That is the main substance of this chapter. We get a slightly closer look at the relationship between Mr Rokesmith and Mrs Boffin and Mrs Boffin decides to adopt Sloppy. Now things of interest in this chapter. The conversation that Mrs Boffin and Mr Rokesmith have is quite interesting here. The relationship between Mr Rokesmith and Mrs Boffin is looked at here. Dickens says John Rokesmith's manner towards Mrs Boffin at this time was more the manner of a young man towards a mother than that of a secretary towards his employer's wife. I've talked a lot before about how surrogate families operate in Dickens in a really interesting way, and there are moments in this book where you see Mr and Mrs Boffin sort of adopt Bella Wilfer and Mr Rokesmith as their surrogate children. For example, when Mrs Boffin wants to inform people that she wants to adopt Sloppy, the people she brings into the room to discuss with her are her husband, Bella Wilfer, and John Rokesmith, and in an odd way they form a sort of family. And the conversation that Mrs Boffin and Mr Rokesmith have is quite interesting. Mr Rokesmith is of course presented as a man of mystery, his name even means like Mystery Smith, Weaver of Mysteries or whatever, but Mrs Boffin seems to be able to see into him more than other people can, and we find out quite a lot of information about him in this way. That he had a sibling who died a long time ago, that his parents are both dead, that he has no other relations, and that he is under 30. All of these things we didn't really know before, and it's quite interesting to find out a few more solid facts about Mr Rokesmith, and perhaps soon we will find out a few more solid facts but anyway. And the other thing I enjoy in this chapter is Sloppy. I like that Sloppy cares so much about Betty Higdon that the idea that he would be abandoning her in some way just makes him howl with tears because he can't bear the fact that he might leave her because he cares about her so much. Again we see a sort of surrogate parental relationship in that Sloppy views Mrs Betty Higdon both as his mistress in a way in the fact that he works for her but also as his mother or his grandmother. The fact that he cares about her so deeply is really important here. Sloppy is entirely unrespectable. He behaves in a way that even the footman at the Boffin's house finds a little bit offensive and a little bit too vulgar for him but he is genuinely good at heart and that is what Dickens cares about most. That is what Dickens triumphs and that is nice. So there we have it. That is I think all I wanted to say about December's chapters. I thoroughly enjoyed the chapters for December. In the month of January, we will be reading three chapters. Chapter 11, Some Affairs of the Heart. Chapter 12, More Birds of Prey. And Chapter 13, A Solo and a Duet. A Solo and a Duet is one of my favourite chapters in this book. I'm not sure it's my favourite chapter in this book, but I think it's probably my second favourite chapter in this book. 
I'm very excited to talk about this one and I'm sure January's video when it is up, hopefully in not too many weeks, will be rather a long one because there are many things to discuss and I'm so excited for soon, soon. January's chapters are very exciting. I hope you have all enjoyed today's video and that you are all continuing to enjoy Our Mutual Friend. I'll be back very soon with another video and hopefully it won't be too long before my video on January's chapters are up. I am hoping to actually get on top of the read-along this year.